I remember meeting Clive Davis a few years later. Papadi, good to see you. You know, Shaggy, that should have been you. I think I make music for myself. So I, I don't think career-wise, it's been really good. Suddenly I had money and it was like, oh, I'm going to New York let's do promotion. And I don't think I've dealt with my mother's passing. I've, I've got this kind of like irritated, uh, what she did uh, to me regarding uh, dad. We used to go to like all these reggae stores. So this blonde, cute mother would be standing in the back of a dub vendor with all the sound system guys. And they were like, who? Checking her out. Everything just happened. And I, I asked my brother, what are they smoking? I was like, what's that funny smell? It was dark between songs. And then drop those fills from Carlton Barrett. I was just saying, can I have one more seven inch, please? But I'm happy. That's Papa D. And stick with this interview until the end, because there's an amazingly shocking story of a false accusation that ended up in court in Sweden. So here is the charming, the humorous, the open and the entertaining Papa D. You're listening to Pop, The History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to start because we've been yeah. talking just a couple of sentences before and you said it doesn't feel like lo long, but it's been ages. It's been, I think, 32 years since <laughs> we have I, I don't know, Maybe because that, that time was so vibrant and it was so much fun and so much energy. So it just doesn't feel like it's, it, it just feels like now. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? I mean, the thing is, I'm sure we've both massively changed in our lives over that period. Um, and we'll come to that later uh, during the interview. I have too. A lot has happened to me. So um, I'm hoping this will be a really sure. interesting one because I feel a connection to you yeah. because of my time at MTV and coming to Sweden such a such a lot and, and meeting you in really quite the early days of MTV. So um, I want to go back um to your life and when you grew up because you have a Swedish mother and a Ghanaian father and your father left yes. when you were very young did you know him at all yeah, well he worked for the embassy in London uh it's complicated I I really think my mother just kind of messed that up and kind of just uh lost contact and I really tried you know she died uh five years ago and I really tried uh, to get some information. I didn't get any. Uh, she was like, oh, I, I think I, I, I tried to really say something about dad. And then she said, well, he was really nicely dressed and he was so much fun. That's it. That's all I know about my father. I don't have any pictures. So it's really my mother was weird. Single mothers can get weird. And she, she had a tough time in the 70s. So I don't know. <laughs> but it's okay, then how did that make you feel as a child growing up that your father had gone and he wasn't in contact with you. It must have had an effect on you. Yeah, it was kind of weird because I, I actually found letters and postcards. So he was trying to get in contact with me, uh, but my mother kind of hid those. I, I think she, I was kind of pissed off. I still have a hard time uh, grieving my mother because there's so much things that she did and she hid my father and she stopped, you know. So I didn't feel so much when I was growing up. Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, she was a really good mother. I had my older brother. Uh, something was missing, but it wasn't really until I turned, I don't know, teenager. Uh, you know, then I started, you know, thinking about it. But growing up as a kid, it was just like, no, I didn't have a dad. But it, it was just natural because it was never there from the beginning. Uh, I think it's worse when uh, parents divorce when you're like seven. That's more tra traumatic. Uh, but it's a weird one, especially lately. I have a five-year-old son and, you know, it's like gr African grandfather, uh, no pictures. It's, it's, really, it's weird. <laughs> that, that, that's why I'm still kind of not so happy with my mother, uh, you know, as I said. Okay, I want to um, talk about the music that your mother listened to when you were young and what you were listening to through her and when your taste changed. Can you tell me what it was like at home? <laughs> It's weird because we actually had uh, two or three Ghanaian records, uh, High Life. I remember uh, the, the label was Decca and they were really like messed up and the <laughs> scratchy. Uh, but she used to play them. I think they were kind of fond memories for her. 
Um, I'm actually trying to find those records on Discogs because <laughs> I, I have the I have a broken record and I'm really trying to find it. Uh, Mother was more kind of like a pop, uh, you know. She would play normal English pop music, but she was quite musical. I think my I think I got all my musical things from my older brother. He's six years older, and we used to go to London a lot. And I think uh, maybe not at the time, but it was really our way of trying to find black culture. It was buying records in London. My brother would buy reggae, soul and funk, and nobody listened to that in Sweden. In Sweden, it was just rock. Uh, what we in Sweden called gubrock, which is like old white people men's rock. <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially in Gothenburg, where, where, where I came from. So, so we were kind of isolated. We, we had each other and we played black music. And he, he had really good taste, my brother, in the, in the 70s. Uh, so he used to buy the records he wanted for himself. He used to buy uh, for me. Uh, I remember getting all these fantastic records on my 10th birthday. It was Lee Perry, Super Ape. Uh, Hepton's Party Time, like classic reggae albums, because I was more the reggae guy and he was more the P-Funk soul guy. Uh, uh, so I, I, I got a lot from, from going to London and from my brother and also I think uh, without knowing it, trying to find our black side, you know, our black culture. Do you think that was then a sort of compensation for not having contact to your father, the music? Yeah, you have to find something to identify with. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he took me, to, he was really nice when I was growing up. Uh, he took me to a Bob Marley concert, I don't know, 78 or something. I was 12. <gasps> it's fantastic. And we used to, he used to take me to, you know, the, the black movies that were around, Car Wash. <laughs> Not the best movie, but, you know, uh, Car Wash and the reggae movies, The Harder They Come and and uh, the Rockers and all those movies. So so I, I think it was it was a good trying to find something to identify with. What did you, do you, you saw Bob Marley at 12 years of age? Yeah. On stage. Tell me, tell me about that impression of him and what an impression it made on you. I mean, I, mean, I, I started listening to the early Bob Marley records. I used to steal my, my brother's records, Catch a Fire, you know, Natty Dread was my favorite, The Rest of My Vibration. So it, it was, I was just, uh, it was quite overwhelming. It was dark between songs. And then drop those fills from Carlton Barrett. I was just saying, oh. and I, I asked my brother, what are they smoking? I remember he said, uh, Indian herb cigars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I didn't realize what it was. <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, what's that funny smell? Uh, but but it, 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 was, it was amazing. I still remember every, uh, and it, that was Bob Marley at his peak. And Bob Marley was my favorite. So, so that was pretty amazing. So thank you, brother. My um, my father was a sort of emotionally absent father when he was at home, and he left when I was uh, um, a teenager. And my mother told, when he died, my mother told me that he had never been interested in me and didn't want a third son, and I was the third son, and he didn't have any contact with me for the first few years of my life. This is what my mother told me. I, I think he did have some contact, but I'm pretty sure not a lot, and he wasn't a very emotionally open person so I I you know I believe her in to that extent and I think some of the reason that I got drive to search for some sort of fame or attention or to be on tv was to get the love that my father hadn't given me how much do you think you can put down to your drive in life and your sort of quest um to what you've become, which is a, a, a musician, has been down to that event. I don't know. I, I mean, for me, I, I was kind of shy when I grew up. So I was just really into music. I started collecting vinyl. And then I, you know, I started DJing. I think his absence just made me look for black culture and, and I found my music. I don't think I ever had, I, I don't think my ambitions was, uh, my because my, I never had the ambition to be on stage because <laughs> I, I was so shy but then I, I started with a few bands and I was I was good at what I was doing and that gave me confidence so I, I didn't have that drive and ambition I was just kind of uh, but I, you know when, now when you mention it <laughs> there might be something maybe that's got something to do with it 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think one of the interesting things is when your second parent dies, which has happened to you five years ago, I think you said, with your mother passing, um, it does change your life. You become, in a sense, an orphan, mm -hmm. like yeah. an, 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 an orphaned adult. And that there are two things in that. That is suddenly your orientation in life. You, you know, it's like you've been on a train track and in front of you, uh, you know, was your mother. Um, and for me, it's a similar thing for many, many years. And my mother died four years ago. And then it opens up and it gives you an opportunity to almost make all the decisions yourself in your life without reference to your parents who who had an, a, an impact. So has, has that in the last four years changed you enormously? <clears throat> but the thing is, <laughs> the year my mother left, uh, I got my little son, Julian. And I remember telling her that, uh, oh, you, you're gonna be a grandmother. And she, she was a bit, she wasn't really, she didn't have total dim uh, dementia, but she was a little bit confused in the end. But I remember she lit up and she was like, oh. So, but it, it was kind of when she left, I, 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 I got Julian and I was dealing with him. And I don't think I've dealt with my mother's passing because I've, I've got this kind of like irritated, uh, what she did uh, to me regarding uh, dad. But then she also was a bit confused the last 15, 20 years. So, so suddenly I was grieving the young mother that we used to go to London when I was a teenager. She was fun, she was fun. We used to go to like all these reggae stores. So this blonde, cute mother would be standing in the back of a dub vendor with all the sound system guys. And they were like, who oh, checking her out. And I would be like, can I have one more seven inch please? She was cool. We used to buy clothes and uh, and we used to go to all the you know the, all the shops, <clears throat> but then she got really confused in the end. So I have two mothers, the really kind of like, oh, pain. Uh, she, she was weird and confused, but then I have the cool mother up until she was like 35, 40. So it was weird. I, I don't think I've dealt with it actually. Did, <laughs> now did, I'm just dealing with my beautiful five-year-old. Did she um? I mean, it sounds like she was, at least at that period, she did inspire you to a certain extent creatively by being with you while you're choosing records and sort of supporting you in that way. Were there other people in your life? I don't know, a teacher, apart from your brother, obviously he was there, but, uh, you know, a teacher, anybody else who sort of gave you the idea that a creative life could be a fulfilled one and one that you could follow? Because for many creative people, and, and it's the same for me, you're you're t often told, you know, I was told to be um, a tax advisor, <laughs> which which actually may have been a really good idea looking back, <laughs> but something that I wouldn't have wanted to do and would never fulfil me creatively. So, was there were there people, other people in your life, who could support the idea of where you were slowly developing to? In, in a way, I was a little bit isolated. You know, my music taste. I remember sitting at home in my little room, just pumping uh, music and playing drums along with, you know, Blackie Huru records. So I, I, I was a bit of a, I wasn't a loner because I, you know, I did, I played football, but when it came to music and, and all that, I was, I was a bit lonely, but then actually there was a guy called uh, Ross Joe, this dread, and he took me in early uh, to DJ and he let me be a little bit on the mic. You know, I used to uh, copy like Yellow Man and, early like toasters and DJs, Lone Ranger. Uh, and, and he encouraged me, he was good, he was good. He, he was dealing with a lot of, uh, taking care of a lot of kids and bringing them in and, and we, had, we had these like reggae parties. So I guess that was good, but then everything moved so quick. Cause when, you know, I started playing in bands in the Stone Funkers when I was like 17, uh, I was like background vocals and I was still a little bit shy. And then I started doing my own things. And then suddenly when I was 20, I got signed by Clive Davis. <laughs> Clive Davis, came, you know, one of the biggest uh, record company, uh, a &R executives ever. So he came over to see me and Tio and suddenly I had a record deal when I was 20. I, I had just released two records. So, so I, I can't say I had any real mentors except for Ross Joe in Gothenburg. I was pretty much a loner developing and just listening to music. I used to order one package of music from London every month uh, from Dub Vendor. Uh, I, I, I worked 
almost every day after school to be able to go to London a couple of times a year and to order my little package of music. Uh, and then I would take it home and I would sit at home. None of my friends loved reggae, liked reggae. So, <laughs> uh, so mentors, no. My brother also, especially shaping my taste. He was good, he was good, he was good. I mean, it was an era where diversification, as it's called, was taking place in Sweden and more people of colour, people from different cultures were, were moving to Sweden and it, and it was expanding in its sort of cultural, you know, this sort of to become more of a cultural melting pot than it was. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in essence, you were in that era. Um, it was also an era where music was uh, changing in the mid 80s with the sort of the Swemix uh era and telegram and all those all those things that were happening how aware were you that that was happening i don't know what age you were in sort of 85 when that notice about Swemix was was happening what would you have been then i was 19 right 66 yeah i was 19 uh in in mid uh... so you you had already made um funky ragamuffin by then you uh, eight, eight, you i think that's 86 right yeah, it was about that. It must have been about that time. Yeah, and yeah. that was that was Magnus Freiberg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, how did you come into contact with him, and how did that come about? Uh, I did my military service, and th this great, great DJ um, Michael Goulos, he had this fantastic club uh, called Zanzibar. So I, I was basically invited. To that. that was my, uh, I think, it was it my first time in Stockholm, even. Or maybe my second time. So I came up there uh, and I was just in the DJ booth chatting. And I remember Freak Barry and the, the record company owner for Telegram, uh, Klaus Luning, they saw me and they were, oh, what's this? And then for some reason, a television show was there filming at the club. So I ended up being on television. And from there, me and Freak Barry started working together. So, so we just did Funky Ragamuffin and I let the music play. So that was my, uh, it wasn't really my first time in the studio because I've done some bits and pieces with uh, Stone Funkers and also <laughs> with my first reggae band called Beat About the Bush. Okay, but the Stone Funkers were, as you said, just before and just after that uh, uh, period. And they were formed by Emrik and Torsten Larsson, who yes. had been the to the States. And they were influenced by soul and funk in, in, in the States. Yep. So how much do you think that you got out of being in the Stone Funkers in terms of actually widening your perception of music and how much do you think your contribution was? I mean, we came from the same place. I mean, I mean, because Sweden was what it was at the time, I found my music in, uh, in, uh, in London. They went to the States and they were exchange students and and they got in contact with all this, you know, funk and early hip hop and go-go and all that. So, so we had the basic P-funk as well, of course. Uh, we had the basic, you know, same taste. Uh, well, you know, I mean, first of all, that was the first band that I was really touring with. We, we traveled around. I mean, Sweden was kind of backwards at the time. Even just being a, a bunch of uh, people of color and mixed people, we kind of look a bit crazy as well. I mean, our hero was George Clinton's. We, we might have looked weird when, when we come, you know, we would come up uh, to a town up uh, way up north and people would get up. And there were even people like saying, ah, it's like, like really racist. It was kind of like a, a going into an Alabama bar, <laughs> a classic, uh, uh, you know, American movie scene. It, was, it really was like that. I, 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 you know, people forget how kind of backward Sweden really was. You came in, everything turned quiet. And we were like, <laughs> so uh, just <clears throat> the experience of touring and just, getting out in Sweden and getting experience on stage. And, and we were such, we had so much fun. We were so, especially at the beginning, we were really mates and we played fantastic music on the tour bus. Emrik used to, and we used to contribute to all of us, but he used to play all these fantastic mixtapes. It was tapes, uh, you know, Public Enemy, EPMD, and all those. it was fantastic. Good times. <laughs> It, it fascinates me that, you know, that you mentioned that uh, uh, Sweden was backward at that point. I mean, you know, all countries have been backward yeah. and still are to a certain extent, uh, you know, and in America, you know, I've talked to artists, which, as you sort of mentioned, the Alabama idea, who, you know, would have to go into the back door of a diner and, 
you know, they were treated so badly. It's yep. it feels like it. It's a you know a different world and era um, today. And they've mentioned how that made them feel at the time. So I just wondered how that made you feel as a person of color in Sweden. It, you know, I, I didn't get sad or hurt. Uh, you know, we were a group, we were a gang. We were just like, oh my God, he's back with people. Really? Did they really say that? <laughs> I remember, especially one one time we played in this beautiful, like, mm, uh, archipelago, uh, typical Swedish restaurant, everything in wood and people were eating fish and shrimps. And it was fantastic. And there's this uh, couple, and um, they look like the granny. Uh, 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 that you always wanted, white hair, and they looked really cute. And, and then I heard them, then I was like, what did they say? Th then they said, oh, we shouldn't have let, was it niggers? Yeah, we, uh, something really bad, like, oh, they, we can't let the in. Jesus, did, my, did the perfect granny just say that? Horrible things, uh, we, we shouldn't let them in, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> those kind of things happened in those days. They leave an impact because, I mean, I'm a, as a gay man, I remember, you know, in London in the early 80s, being on a, on a train with my boyfriend, which is the weirdest thing, which obviously this woman didn't know. And um, she had a newspaper with Martina Navratilova, who was the big tennis star at that time. And she said, look at her, look at her. She's a man. She looks like a man. It's disgusting. She's disgusting. She's a lesbian. And just went on like this. And I just eventually said, this is my boyfriend. And she got up and walked off. But it did, you know, events like that would have, they they would leave a sort of, I wouldn't say a scar, but they would leave a note mm. somewhere inside me, which was very aware, which made me very aware that there was something that I was different. Now, as a gay man and a white gay man in a white society, people don't necessarily know that you're gay. But as a black man in a white society, it's all, you know, it's there, as it were. So there, there is a difference. But I just find it interesting that those things can have a lasting, leave a sort of lasting mark on you, which, which questions um, and reinforces your own identity and your wish to discover and be like stand behind your identity. Did did it make you stronger in that? I way? think it made me stronger. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, because I remember all these incidents, it kind of left a sting, you know. Like, mm. but but at the same time, I kind of always felt like, oh my god, they're idiots. I'm superior, you know. I'm from a different, and you're just backwards. So I I I, I never thought. I never felt like oppressed or anything. I, I remember when I played football in Gothenburg, early 80s, I was 12, 13, like boys playing football. I was in a team and I was, I was pretty big and I was a, 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 a defender. And I used to just uh, like, not rough, uh, I, I would, it, would, it would be uh, legal. I mean, what do you say, legal? And so I would yeah, be pretty rough to people. And I remember the, the mothers and fathers they would scream like racist stuff, like, you know, like, are you crazy? We're 12 years old and like, get that black bastard. Goes, really? <laughs> that, that made me actually, I quit football because I thought, I, I just didn't like the whole, it was just, it's just a bunch of idiots. I don't, I don't want to do this. I, I, I didn't think it was fun. It wasn't because I was hurt deeply inside. I was just like, I can't deal with this anymore. Parents screaming. <laughs> That's oh, so God. weird. That is so weird. It's now, obviously, you were in a circle that Robin Raz was, you know, part of and in. So you'd already, I presume, met them. But was there an approach for them to record with them? And how did that come about? Or was the approach from you? Or was it something that just naturally? I came think, uh, I mean, it, it was obvious, obviously, we were on the same label. They just got signed. Maybe it was Klaus Looming. Uh, from Telegram Records that put us together, or I, I rather I think that I had a name, you know, as an MC. You know, I was a good rapper, you know, especially reggae uh, uh, toaster, and I, I think so that's how uh, a lot of different things. But I think my my reputation as an MC was probably the the, the they look they were looking for people to work with because they had a lot of beats. There was, there was an album out at that time, around that time, I think just before, which is why I'm sort of bringing it up, which was the Eric B and Rakim album, Paid in Full, which so many artists, so many artists cite as a massive influence on them. What was new about 
their music and that album that sort of connected to you? I, I, it was definitely Rakim. I mean, his way, I mean, he's such a, uh, he's such an amazing, his flow is just so different, so cool. And the, 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 the way he uses, uses the language is, is poetic and he's, he's got twists and turns. I, I'm just, I've always, that's always been my favorite MC. <laughs> Yeah, there was a much more uh, writerly music. style to him, wasn't there? That was the thing. And that was something that was really beats different. And, beats and samples were really good as well. I, I, that's when I was getting into the rare groove thing via London, and they really used some good like rhythm and blues and funk samples. Uh, not, not so much, uh, you know, Run DMC had heavy drums and rock, but, but they were doing the, you know, Bobby Bird and all that. And 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 you were always trying to find the samples, you know. You were always looking like, what's this? You know, asking people, and people would try to keep it secret. So uh, that was a great time. I mean, they had a, they had a track called No Competition, and then you recorded a track called Competition, Competition. is None. So uh, there's obviously <laughs> the connection there. I mean, I don't consider myself a great rapper, and I'm a really good reggae MC, uh, but I, I can hear, I can really hear that I'm trying to. My phrasing is definitely trying to be Rakim and maybe M uh, EPMD as well, like, like a kind of cooler approach to writing rhythms, uh, but definitely Rakim. <laughs> Lyrically as well, of course, you know, you kind of pick up stuff here and there. But that was a track that did reference that, uh, yeah. that, that song. That was clearly, clearly there. It was so obvious. It was kind of an homage to <laughs> Yeah. There was... Um, uh, it, your career seems to be um, something where you you dip in to so many different styles along the way um, and then have a sort of short-lived period in uh, a combination with an artist or a combination with producers mm -hmm. and then move on to something else. Why... Is that such a part of you? And why is it so important to be inspired and moved by so many different cultures and eras and styles and music? I, I think it's really my uh, weakness and my strength, I guess. But it's really career-wise, it's not good to like, you know, I come from reggae and hip hop and then I do reggae hip hop for a while. And then, then in the mid nineties, it was, you know, uh, too many opinions and record companies and I don't know. So I got confused in the nineties. I did some good pop songs, but then it was like, uh, and parallel to my, uh, my career, I was always in the Brooklyn Funk Essentials. And that was very uh, challenging and interesting and uh, big jazz festivals and kind of tricky arrangements. And uh, so I developed a lot in, in, in the Stone Funkers. So that, that was fun. I, I ooh. Uh, but then, you know, I, I love my Latin music, I love my disco music, I love my, and I just want to try, I, I, I think I make music for myself, so I, I don't think career-wise it's been really good. It's always good to stick with something, you have a formula, or Bruce Springsteen, you know, or you do reggae, or, you know, I, I've been kind of jumping around a bit too much, but I'm happy. You mentioned Clive Davis earlier. <laughs> and that uh, you were approached by him very, very early on. Can you tell me about that approach? And also what has Clive Davis with Sweden? Because you're not the only artist in Sweden that Clive Davis approached. <coughs> I mean, he, he came over specifically, he flew over. I mean, this is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, and he, at the time I was like, yeah, 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 I've heard of him. Uh, but he actually came over and saw us, us to see us play live, me and Titiu with a band. And he was like, they're stars. Du, 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 du. And then it got a bit confused, but we basically... Um... Can you just, just stop there? Because when, he, when someone like Clive Davis says, they're stars, and there you are, pretty new. <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, basically completely new in, in 20. Yeah, and what you're doing. Uh, obviously impressionable at that age as well, in terms of someone of his stature saying, you know, this, this is a star. Um, how did that make you feel? And what, you know, what did you, um, what were your expectations when he said something like that? 
funny because in those in those days everything just moved so quickly so you didn't really have thing to time to think you know now i was watching the documentary on netflix the Clive davis documentary i was like wow he signed us and so, so now i'm kind of like oh. but at the time it was just like yeah he likes us too okay we got signed there suddenly i had money and it was like oh i'm going to new let's do promotion and everything just happened no time for reflection i i think that's people's early careers i think people everything moves really fast I, I i remember meeting clive davis a few years later it didn't really work out there was friction between the uk office arista and the new york office and and the swedish it was a bit confused the whole launch and uh, even Tatio's launch was a bit weird. Anyway, so I met him. We were going to do the New Orleans Jazz Festival. And he comes in, Papa D! No, this is like, what, 97 or something? Papa D, good to see you. You know Shaggy? That should have been you. And then he walked on. <laughs> you talked about your first gig. Bob Marley and the Jamaican influence, and it was in the '90s that you sort of delved much more into that. What was what was the the trigger for that for you, and what did you start to do? Reggae, the reggae thing. Yeah, uh, I, I just loved everything about reggae. I, you know, I, I, I mean, '70s reggae was really spiritual. It, it was fantastically played. You know, I loved the militant roots reggae, Black Uhuru. It was just my music. And then I started getting into reggae MCs like Yellow Man and Lone Ray. I was just fascinated with the language. I remember one of those records that my brother gave me on my 10th birthday was Prince Jasbo Croaking Lizard. Still one of my favorite tracks. So I remember I learned that uh, by heart. I didn't understand a word. I, there's still a song, there's words in that song that I don't understand. Probably because I learned it when I was 10 years old. So I only know the kind of, the, just, I, I knew the words, but I didn't know what it was. So that was my first getting, I was so fascinated by the language, the rhythm, the vibe, the spirituality, and, and you know, listening to, to lyrics in the 70s, I mean. Uh, when, when did you go to Jamaica? When did you visit Jamaica first? Well, that took a long time. I think I went there, uh, well, 90, actually, but, uh, when I had a bit of money. I, I, yeah, I went there in the 90s. Uh, that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you worked with, um, um, what's he called, Lady Saw, which is, mm. uh, so how, how did how did that come up? Had you, had you met her before or were you introduced to her? How did that come about? Um, I mean, the first time we went there, we were just kind of fascinated by all the, you know, the, the classic uh, places, the who the clubs and the, you know, uh, uh, studios and. When you say we, who who were you with? I was there with Michael Goulos, the guy with Zanzibar, and uh, so that was more kind of uh, reggae tourism the first time. But I think I met her at a, um, um, uh, what do you call it, a um, conference, like a reggae music conference. And we got along really well. And, you know, she's always been my hardcore female favorite. So I was just, I just asked her and, we, you know, that's what you do. You come up with deals and then you, you record, you know. It's fun, fun. Um, Quite. What do you feel that you contribute to her sound? And what do you feel that she contributed to you and your sound? Well, she gave me some credibility. No, uh, well, she's a heavyweight in reggae, so of course, to, to work with someone like that gives you some kind of uh, nice cred. I, I think a lot of, when I go to Jamaica and they listen to my music, they say, wow, this is cool. I, I can hear the influences, I can hear the reggae, but it's different, and they like that. Uh, so I remember her listening through my album, she was like, yeah, this is good. Even on my first album, in 1990, I worked with the uh, Sleepy Wonder and uh, Shelly Thunder. And they were like, yeah, this is cool, man. This is, I like this, it's different. It's not dance, it's not Jamaican, but it's a different approach. And, and so, so they like, so I, I've been getting cred from, from Jamaica. I love the way, because sometimes I, I don't overdo it, but it's just natural for me to write in Patois, especially when I chat and just, so, so they always like, they always said, you're a good 
your uh, 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 the dub poet in uh, Brooklyn Funk Essentials, Everton Sylvester, he said, "Damn, you're a good Jafakan." A Jafakan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Arthur Baker was the guy that set up the the this this group, wasn't it? The the uh, Brooklyn Funky Essentials, and Arthur Baker, of course, is known as the producer of Africa Bambata and, and, and an unbelievable yeah. uh, career oh. of, of Diana Ross. production. Yeah. Have you have you met him then through this? No, no. We, we, I mean, I lived in New York. Um, I'm, I'm, I kind of moved to New York of 50 percent of my time in uh, what, 93. So uh, the band leader, uh, uh, Latte Kronlund, he started working with Arthur Baker. They were doing house stuff, basically going through a lot of his old tapes from the 80s, finding a cappellas, beats, blah, blah, blah. And then Latte started doing stuff on the side. Like, uh, and Arthur Baker had the name Brooklyn Funk Essentials from some project in the 80s. They only did like two. So he let us have the name. And me and Latte were just going around New York trying to find people for a band for these songs that we we done. So you know, I found the drummer, uh, and he found he found this fantastic uh, uh, slam poet uh, girls. So we went to different venues and just found people, and suddenly we were a fourteen piece band playing all the clubs in New York all through the 90s. And then we started doing international stuff. That was a really fun time, really fun time. I mean, that sounds really like an exciting and creative period. You just mentioned that Arthur Baker, he just gave the name. He wasn't actually then, in a, in a sense, creatively involved. He was involved, of course, you know, he, was, he really liked us. He was kind of like an exec, executive producer. Uh, he helped up with some stuff, but it was basically, Latte kind of took control, Latte Cronland took control of, of the project. And then when we became a live band, it was, it was more, it just morphed into something else. It was a studio project first where Arthur was involved and then it just, then we were suddenly a 14 piece band and it's good times. What makes, what is it about Swedes that makes them so international? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I think it's really serious. It's like the, uh, in the creative industries, you know, if you look at the creative industries around the world, there are uh, many Swedes at the, the top of their game in different industries, you know, and you look at people uh, from, and I'm going to say Aria, or you're a bit younger than me, but Aria, and yeah. uh, from, from Sweden, you've got people like Johan Renk, who's yeah. uh, one of the top, if not the top series yeah. directors in the world at the moment. You've got mm -hmm. people like Jonas Ockerlund, who uh, is also uh, a director and probably one of the biggest video directors there is in the world. Uh, musically, Sweden seems to be a sort of bottomless pit where <laughs> so many artists um, come out of Sweden. And also they, they do seem to be able to move um, internationally. And that isn't true for every country so I just wondered from your perspective why you may think that is or if you think that is one little simple simple thing is that we're pretty good at languages and we never had subtitles you know if you go to France where everything is dubbed and or German it's a different thing we really have a you know from I think I've I've known English since I was a kid from listening to records of course but also because subtitles are just really good way and a lot of countries don't have that that's a very small tiny explanation but I think it's got some kind of importance uh, uh, don't you think so well I always think that Swedes are quite internationally aware and internationally mm -hmm. interested and you definitely are a prime example of that because of the interests in the different styles of music that you've been into over the over the years you know we've talked about some I mean you even worked with Dennis Pop who sort of was the Euro pop king uh you know at, like in the early 90s at, yeah. at his sort of height um and so you sort of moved from style to style and there must be something within you that has this sort of a need to to find out about things internationally and I think a lot of Swedes seem to have that yeah I, I, yeah, I, I, that's a good point, really. I, I don't know, uh, restless, we want to we see what's around the corner. I've always been like that. I love that. 
uh, I mean, I I used to do a radio show for eight years, where I was I, I, it was kind of like a world music program, but mostly like reggae and dancehall, uh, and that was fun. That was fun, finding new music. I've done documentaries, you know, music hip hop in Cambodia. Uh, you know, we went to Africa. We went to oh uh, yeah. I want to see what's around the corner, but I, I don't have any explanation for the whole why 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 there's so many of us in different fields like fashion, music, and film. Uh, I don't know. Where were you in your life in as as a person in the early to mid two thousands? Um, because there's an event that happened which was a bit later, which must have flipped your life upside down i mean it clearly did and it was a clearly horrific event but i just want to sort of get a picture of where you were before that happened mm. uh i was doing too much <laughs> i was doing tv radio music for myself and for the brooklyn funk essentials and for everything i, I even have an album said so that's titled the man who couldn't say no so I was a bit run down and stressed, but I just love doing things and different things. So I couldn't turn down radio and I couldn't turn down the, 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 the documentaries and stuff. So yeah, I had fun, but I was kind of uh, worn out. Okay, and then came an event which must have, as I said, flipped your life upside down and you got arrested in yeah. September of 2008 um, and charged with, what's translated as grave assault. Um, can you tell me about that arrest and was that a complete and utter surprise that it even happened to start with? Of course it was a surprise. It was just, uh, first of all, they locked me up for a month in isolation. And, uh, you know, eventually I was freed. I got damages. I think they had to, because there was so much, it's, it's very, we'd have to do one podcast about that because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of confused and there's a lot of different levels, but basically I was freed. I got damages. My wife was by my side, uh, but they had to do something because they've been writing constantly. So I, I, I got a, uh, like a small fine for, uh, there was an incident where she pushed me three, I don't know why we were fighting, it was just like a drunken, uh, she pushed me three times and then I pushed her like that and went away and she tripped on her. She was in the courtroom showing her what she was wearing. I tripped, there was, she didn't hurt herself, it was nothing. Uh, so basically if uh, there's no injuries, you can't really find somebody. But anyway, they had to do something. Uh, the big thing was the accident uh, drunken accident, uh, she fell backwards and she, she, the, nobody was fighting or beating anybody. And I got freed, but it just turned into like uh, the whisper game. And it was like, uh, uh, you know, no smoke without fire and nobody cared that I got freed. So I was like a shadow. I was like a shadow of, for, you know, for like five, six years. My, I got so stressed waiting for the so my, my heart, one of my valves got fucked up. So I, I, I've done a heart operation. So I was like, I was physically ill and I couldn't see any, I was, I was living in Thailand. I went to New York. I was just like, <sighs> like this. Uh, and then I came back to Sweden and I lived in the countryside. So I was, I was a bit of a, uh, a wreck, shadow. Uh, didn't want to talk to anybody. I was a hermit for a while uh, and for years. But then, you know, what doesn't kill you? Uh, so eventually I just, it's just changed. And I just, wanna, uh, I just wanna sort of paraphrase what happened because I just, it's obviously, it's really difficult and emotional for you to, to talk about still. And I just wanna make it sort of clear so people understand what happened. You were arrested first of all, and then uh, charged with grave assault. But your wife, Andrea, denied any maltreatment but even though she denied maltreatment and she wasn't heard in court you were still found guilty on a lesser charge and given this small fine which you mentioned and mm -hmm. then later on it was upturned and the charges were dropped and you were acquitted and then you were given um some compensation for lost income 
and uh, and what you had suffered essentially yeah. um, at the court. So I just wanted to say that because it's when you read that you go, "Wow, we live in a society today where even a tweet is almost like saying you're guilty." Mm. without it going through a sort of complicated process. And you had this complicated process. You got, in essence, the result that you wanted. But then, as you said, um, there's no smoke without fire is how people think. So how, I mean, I, you, you know, you mentioned that you, you, the heart having, you know, um, a heart operation and how it physically affected you how did it affect you in terms of the wider society and how people were then dealing with you after this event who if they weren't friends and didn't know you they may look upon it in a in a different way to what the truth was yeah i, I don't know i think uh, the people you know i after a while, I, you know, I did gigs. I didn't get any kind of, well, once in a while, somebody would say something, but the people like me and still like me. I think it's more the establishment and the, you know, I've done television a couple of times, but uh, <laughs> I'm not in demand on television. And I'm kind of like uh, persona non grata in a way, but uh, I, I just, you know, I, I still play, I do my thing, and uh, uh, once in a while, if I do a company gig, they would be, oh no, our policy is, but that's just once every two, three years. It actually hasn't been bad, uh, you know, uh, but at the time, oh my God, I, was, I, I, I wouldn't be even be able to speak. Now I'm kind of calm, I don't care. I mean, after Julian and after, after getting my son, uh, I don't think these things are important, so. Uh, but for a while, I was like a, like a shaking, <laughs> broke. Do, would you do you put it down to racism? Uh, I don't like to do the race card thing, but of course, <laughs> there's been similar uh, incidents where actually things happened in a bad way, and they haven't been uh, uh, treated the way I was. Um, it was also it was also like she, she was a young, beautiful girl. I was older, uh, old black, older black guy, and she was young, pretty. So they didn't even listen to her because, you know, she didn't have a voice. She was just some uh, young girl being manipulated by me. So that was weird as well. Uh, but, you know, the race card, uh, definitely part of it. My question to you is, do you want to know about the interviews first? If you do, then subscribe. And if you don't, well, we go on with the interview with Papa D. I think it's also kind of like the, it was a good story. It was a good, good guy turned bad. They love that. Uh, so they just jumped on that. And I, I was so weak at the time, uh, especially afterwards and coming out of like one month. And so I couldn't really, uh, I just disappeared. I, I couldn't, I, <sighs> I was, you know, when or people like, I didn't defend myself. I didn't do anything because I was, I was just, I was just shaken up. And then I got ill, so, and then I did the whole, it took a while, uh, you know, uh, to, to get the heart and the physical thing right, so. One, one thing I mentioned earlier was about, you know, the fact that I'm gay and I've had to deal with certain things in my life. And one thing that I am today is a screenwriter and a lot of my issues that come up in my writing are about identity and mm. and who i am and it's told through my screenwriting it's not that i'm a character in in anything but it's about the themes that have been important to me and in a way they're a way of working through it after this event it, it took a while but and i haven't read the book but i've listened to the album uh you and and i presume the book is is completed and out but i haven't read it you you wrote a book called was jean baptiste bernadotte a black man and and you release an album. No, no I, I really didn't. I, I, that was an idea I had. I don't, I don't, I don't. Ah, you never wrote it. Okay, because <laughs> I was trying to find it and work out what it was. But no. you did uh, write an album called Fall from Grace, mm. which references uh, much of what happened. Um, how important was it for you to write that album? And uh, also, 
what did it bring you? Yeah, it was important. I mean, it was that was really uh, therapy, writing that album. It was. Uh, I think I wrote part of it, a couple of songs while I was <laughs> held for for a month. Uh, Can you tell me about that period then and writing them? So you were held, you were held for a month, which is sort of uh, pretty illegal in international law, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but it's it happened in in Sweden. I don't know if that is. Uh, we've been your case has changed. To, we've been reported to Amnesty many times because it's it's really, you know, a person with no prior, I'm no threat to anybody. So uh, that was really weird. I don't understand. Part of Swedish law is just weird. So tell me about that period and writing those those couple of tracks. Uh, it, it was just uh, horrible. It was one of the worst. Uh, I don't know, I was isolated, I only talked to my lawyer. I, I started doing, uh, I got some books, yoga books and started doing yoga. And I refused to eat any of the candy because that was the only thing you could do in there. Uh, I remember I tried to be healthy and so I could you know, keep a straight mind. Uh, I, it was just horrible, it was just one big blur. But I remember getting some uh, records in some dub records. So I started writing on top of those uh, 70s dub records that somebody, I don't, I can't remember who sent them, but somebody sent me a bunch of records. So I could listen to the, how could I listen to those? Did I have a player? I can't remember. I probably had like a little Walkman or something. Uh, no, it was horrible. Uh, no television or nothing, just books. But it's kind of, you know, uh, when you get beat down like that, you really get, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, the thing about that music is, I mean, I find it, I found that phenomenal because you could feel so much the anger and pain and and all those uh, emotions in that. And even if you look at the Fall From Grace track, you know, this lyric, yeah, yeah, work in mysterious ways, still I've got to, how do you feel when the mob is out to get you? And, uh, you know, there's no candy coating in what you're saying in there it's all it's all in there and it's all in and it's all direct with with um tracks like lying backstabbing uh woman sign of the times um and and i i found it i found it just a fascinating thing and what an experience it must be to try and find yourself through what you've always done in your life which is your your music so do you think music is in a sense um, your savior? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, growing up, it, it was comfort and fun. And uh, when you were alone, you always had the music. Uh, and, and in times like these, oh, of course, or anything, you know, it, people have songs when they break up with people and people when they're happy. I mean, uh, you know, soundtrack of our lives, it's important. But, but it's music has been really important for me. And uh, I think that it's really kept me up, like trying to get stronger. I mean, Fall From Grace is a pretty, uh just therapy album. But then, then I kind of moved away from that and kind of moved on up and tried to just, you know, do different things. And uh, uh, so it's, 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 been, it's been my uh, crutch. Good. T tell me where you are today, because I know you've been in the, in in the studio, and I think are you working with Robin Raz uh, with Raz? Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. DJ, that was fun. We did the very typical '90s track. It's it's called Old School, so uh, that's fun. That, that's one of the more popular things that I've done in, in a while, uh, and, and very much back to the '90s. That was a lot of fun. It's so much fun to work with Raz as well, uh, and we hang out, and uh, we've done a couple of gigs as well this year. Uh, so that's fun. I, I've done a lot of uh, reggae lately. I don't know. I, I do vinyl records. Uh, I press like 500 copies of vinyl and I send them around the world and uh, uh, quite rootsy reggae. I did, uh, you know, I tried to put out an album every second year. I do dub albums, you know, as well. So that's fun. Uh, <laughs> sounds a bit like Spinal Tab. I, I now play for more selective audiences. You remember that scene in Spinal Tap? It's like, you don't, sell, you don't sell as many pop records as you used to. Now, I work with more selective crowds now. <laughs> but it's kind of fun because it's always been my roots and I do big reggae festivals and I'm, I'm very established on the reggae scene and I, I, I'm really enjoying it. So, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm actually tempted to do some more 
and I'm getting into more poppy stuff. I have a rock band called Ringo Franco. Uh, we just mastered the album and it's coming out this autumn, which is kind of something we call ragamuffin rock, which is like kind of punky rock music mixed with, uh, you know, Jamaican chatting and catchy like uh, rock choruses. It's, it's a good band. I'll, I'll send you the material. Ringo Franco, it's coming out. We played in London, love us in London, because they understand all the bits and pieces. They understand the reggae thing that I do vocally, but also the kind of punk, you know, really good band. So we, we did the Camden Rock Festival <laughs> and people in the crowd, some, some of my friends said, well, at least I can say I heard them first. So uh, <laughs> that was, that's, that's brilliant. Um, yeah. I just want to go back to something that was at the beginning, just to yep. finish this, uh, th this interview, because I think it's something that does really fascinating me. And I mentioned that, that, uh, uh, my mother died. I was extremely close to my mother and looked after her for the last three years of her life permanently, although it was much longer than that, um, you know, in, in a sort of part time basis. Um, and I had a very good and close relationship with her. And as I sort of mentioned, this idea of being an orphaned adult, and I'd read a book which is called The Orphaned Adult um, a few years before she died because I knew she was dying and I just thought, okay, I need to somehow prepare myself, but you can't prepare yourself, but you think no. you can. So I, I read this book and it was all about how when a parent, was, particularly uh, a second parent dies and that you are effectively then an orphan, it then gives you also an opportunity of life, uh, of life to look at what you really want in all aspects of your life with no one else sort of ahead of you or guiding you or mm -hmm. some sort of guide in your brain, you know, in that sense. And, and for me, it was a really amazing period going through the grief and then deciding where I wanted to go in my life. So when do you think you're going to go through the take on the grief? Because you said you've ignored the grief because I think the grief is such an important period and it's a period where you will come out the other side it sounds like you're already creating the new world that you want mm -hmm. uh, and sort of getting to the other side so when are you just gonna you know look at the grief side oh, no, I don't know it's I don't I, I mean I, I just jumped into the the Julian thing uh, and it kind of felt like a good Francis, she died, new life. We actually got the, the date for him, for his uh, birth was supposed to be, now he was born two days before, but it was on her birthday, 1st of August. He was born the 29th, but it was like the date we were given for him was when she, so it felt, really felt like a trip. But, but the grief thing, ooh, I'm so divided. It's, it's ooh, uh, I guess eventually it's gonna come, but it's gonna take a while, I'm, I'm kind of, 100% in, into, uh, I think it's fantastic. I'm 56 and I have a five-year-old. I'm so glad that I got to to uh, uh, experience this. So I don't think I've had time to really deal with a mother. But it will come. It has to come. Well, I'm really pleased that your life has opened up and that you're doing so many things. And for me, it's been an honor and an absolute pleasure just to see you again after all these years. <laughs> yeah. And you fared better than I have, I have to say, in the looks department. You're still looking a good looking guy. So um, listen, I want to wish you a lot of success. Thank and you. Um, I may actually be in Gothenburg. Are you in Stockholm or Gothenburg no, now? I'm, I'm kind of uh, 40 minutes away from uh, in a smaller town outside of Stockholm. Outside of Stockholm. Okay. Yeah. So the next time in Stockholm, I must contact you because we, we've definitely. But hold on when you've got I'm, I'm there. Oh, okay. All right. You shall definitely. Well, listen, uh, Papa D, thank you. And I wish you much success and an opening up of your life and, uh, you know, a, a positive and uh, wonderful future, uh, particularly with your son, Julian. Thank you so much. Bless. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect.